Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope this is recording, but I'm pretty sure that it is. My name is Nisha. I am one of the ELM tutors, um, an academic coach, and also one of the instructors for our GLS course this semester. Um, so this is kind of, as I'm sure you're expecting, the next uh, presentation in your series of weekly presentations. So this would be part three of our metacognitive approach to academia. Um, Sarah Coates, who presented the last two weeks, um, is also part of our team. And the final two weeks will be presented by uh, Natalie, who you guys will meet next week. So uh, great to meet you all. Thank you for your patience with this sort of um, recorded format. I apologize for not being able to actually be there live, um, but I'll try to make this as interactive as possible. And I've included a video and things like that, just so um, it's not, you know, 30 minutes of me talking at you. Um, but feel free while I'm speaking to sort of utilize the chat, um, talk to each other, kind of respond to some of the questions I'll pose. I know I can't actually you know, see what you're saying and respond to that, but um, by all means, feel free to talk to each other while I'm presenting. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. So hopefully this is visible. We'll give it a second to load. All right, so like I was saying, this is um, the next presentation in your series of metacognitive presentations. And so this presentation is really gonna be about you know, how are you utilizing your class time? Um, and that includes preparation for class and homework time outside of class, and some strategies for effective reading and effective note taking, since I know those things are a huge part of what you'll be doing um, throughout your undergrad degree and really throughout any degree that you get. So quick pitch for our ELM team. I'm sure you know this by now, um, but this is us. You've already met Sarah. Um, I'm Nisha, like I said before, and uh, Natalie on the right is who you guys will meet next week. So just to start out, I just wanna pose this question to all of you. What do you actually do during class? And take a moment to kind of think about that. Um, as I know, it can be hard to realize when you're sort of daydreaming or zoning out or just kind of mindlessly scrolling through something. It can also be hard to realize when you're paying attention but not really documenting the information that you're hearing in any way or not really processing it in any sort of way. So I'll give you a couple seconds. Feel free to you know throw in answers in the chat or um, speak aloud if you want. I obviously can't respond, but um, just take a minute to reflect on this. What do you usually find yourself doing during class? Um, and specifically during lectures where it's a lot of information transfer that you're expected to just kind of absorb. So I'll pause for a couple seconds here and just let you all think about that um, and maybe respond to that to each other. So kind of moving forward here, I'm sure a lot of the answers were things like, you know, daydreaming, like in this picture, or listening for part of the time, but then starting to zone out um, after a certain amount of time. And I'm sure this is especially true for online classes, where not only are you expected to sit there and listen, but you're sitting there and listening in perhaps your home or perhaps an area where there's a lot of distractions. So kind of keep this question in mind as we start running through um, the rest of this presentation. Question number two, which is kind of related to question one, is what does your workspace look like? This is a kind of a unique time we're in now where a lot of us are working from home or working from somewhere that we usually wouldn't work from. Um, and this includes class. A lot of classes are hybrid or online entirely. Um, so do you find yourself you know, in a situation like in the comic on the right where you're working from your couch, you know, you have no motivation to like get up and get dressed in the morning, your home life and your work and school life all just kind of blend together in this amorphous blob. Um, if this sounds like what you're experiencing, that's super common um, and that's happening to a lot of people right now. However, uh, the reason I want to highlight this question is because as I'll talk about later, your workspace really does prime your brain to 
do something, um, whether that's relax or whether that's pay attention or whether that's um, ingest and synthesize information, the area in which you place yourself to do this task has a huge effect on whether you actually do it successfully. So that's another thing I want you guys to think about as we run through some of these strategies is what does your workspace look like? And even right now, if you just take a look around you, what do you see? Um, do you see like disorder and distraction or do you have like a really clear designated area from which you do your work? Uh, could be both depending on the day and, and what class you're in. So take a, take a moment to also think about that and uh, keep that on the back burner while we keep going. So like I just said, really your environment primes your brain to do things. Um, and this, this is a tough thing now because we're often working from the same place that we relax, that we hang out with people, that we spend time with friends and family, you know, whether that's your living room or your bedroom or whatever. So it can be difficult when you kind of get up to go to school and you're going to school involves walking to your couch. And your couch is also where you relax at the end of the day. So it's really confusing for your brain. And your brain is kind of wondering like, okay, I'm sitting in the place where I usually chill and relax. And now I'm expected to listen to a lecture. For that reason, what I really encourage you to do is designate an area in your home or wherever you work from that is just for work. Um, and make sure all you do in that area is work. And that, that like I said, um, is because your brain is really primed by its environment. So if you go to your workspace, whether that's just a table that you set up in a corner or a desk or whatever, your brain already knows that it's going to be processing information, studying, uh, memorizing things, reading. And so you're kind of ready to do that. Whereas if you go to your couch and try to do it, your brain's kind of like, oh, I'm gonna watch TV now. I'm gonna you know, take a nap now. And it becomes that much harder to motivate yourself and to get yourself to actually engage with your material. So that's why really allocating an environment for yourself where you know that the only thing you do there is study or you know, uh, review material from class or whatever it is, um, that's super important just for study strategies in general. Because kind of everything I'm gonna run through today, if you don't have a good place to do it free of distractions, it's not gonna be helpful. So that's why I wanted to start with this idea of like, just thinking about your workspace and thinking about how you work um, and making sure that you're setting up an environment for yourself where you're most likely to be able to engage with your material effectively. So if you notice from this picture that you're more the guy on the left, maybe try to you know adjust some things, move some things around and make sure that you're, the space in which you're trying to work is set up to help you succeed. So like I said, two things I wanna to cover today, strategies for effective reading and strategies for effective note-taking. So I'm sure everyone can relate to this, but there's a ton of reading involved in school. Um, whatever your major is, pretty much every single major entails some amount of reading that you're expect expected to do. Um, and a lot of this reading is kind of assigned before class and you're expected to do it in preparation for your lecture. And more often than not, it doesn't happen. You might crack open the textbook and skim it a little bit, but probably not retain anything and then go to lecture. And that's kind of a pattern that a lot of people, myself included, experience. Um, however, why is it important to review material before lecture? Because it helps for memory. And we've all kind of heard this along the way, but that's hard to actually do when you just have so much reading for so many classes. So what are some ways in which you can maximize your efficiency while you're reading? Here's one method that I think is pretty helpful, um, and it's also doable in a limited amount of time. So for the amount of time that you put in, it really helps you maximize what you're retaining from your reading. So I'm going to kind of run through each of the steps in this um, SQ3R method. So the S part, the first step, is just a survey. And in this step, you're really just figuring out what it is that you're actually reading. Um, skim the text and see what it looks like. What's the layout? Is it a journal article? Is it a chapter? Um, are there images, whether those are graphs or pictures? Um, how is it laid out? Have the authors highlighted certain things? 
Um, I know a lot of textbooks have sort of, you know, important terms or important uh, concepts boxed out separately from the rest of the text. So that first step is really just you getting a sense of what it is that you're even looking at. And it also primes your brain again to expect certain things. So if you notice, uh, for example, you're reading a textbook chapter, you notice four headings um, and two graphs, you can kind of tell yourself, okay, this reading is divided into four sections. So there might be four main concepts or points that I'm expected to know. And two of those come with a graph that further explains what I'm going to be reading. So this step is kind of like just getting a lay of the land a little bit, um, getting yourself prepared to actually engage with the reading by knowing where you're headed. If you just kind of start with no idea of, you know, how many headings are here, what am I even reading, it gets that much harder to process that information. So survey, step one. Step two is the question step. So here you're just kind of asking yourself questions as you begin reading. Um, specifically, what, it, what is it from the reading that you already know? Um, what is it that the reading is telling you? And what is your goal in doing this reading? Um, and these are kind of pretty broad questions. And the point is just kind of for you to start thinking about what is the main point from what I'm reading and why am I reading this at all? So many chapters cover, you know, one concept or one um, topic within a field that you're studying. So your question might be, okay, um, I already know this thing about this topic. I don't know these things. That's why I'm reading this. And the main point from this chapter is to cover this specific theory um, relating to this topic. So something like that, pretty broad, um, just to kind of orient yourself. Because again, when you go in with no direction, you end up wasting time because you're just kind of reading, trying to figure out what you're reading, at the same time trying to figure out why you're reading it. So having these sort of pre-steps in place um, is really helpful and again, can help orient you better. Um, so step three, the actual reading step. So once you've done one and two, keep those in your mind while you start to read. And as you read, additional questions might come up. Um, you'll probably get more information that will answer the questions from step two. Um, you'll probably have more questions about things you don't understand. All of these are valid. Just kind of note them down or um, keep them somewhere where you can refer to them afterwards. Step four, so after you're done with the actual reading step, this recite step is super important for memory. Um, so this step entails you kind of repeating in your own words what it is that you've read. Um, research has suggested that if you do this out loud verbally, um, it's better for memory, but if for some reason you can't do that, you can of course always just type it out or write it down in your notes. Um, as long as you're kind of repeating and reciting what it is that you read in your own words, that step is crucial for um, both, you know, internalizing what you, what you read, the main messages, and also understanding it. So kind of ask yourself questions about the text. Um, you can also explain to someone else what it is that you read. That's a great way to review the material and solidify it in your mind. Um, you can also try to write a summary. And I know, don't expect that all of these are possible for every single reading. If you're feeling like, whoa, this is gonna take me hours, just doing one of these, reciting in one way um, for everything that you read is so helpful in making sure that you remember what you read, one, and that you understand it. Because if in the end, you know, two hours later, if you can't remember at all what it is that you even read, then the whole exercise was pointless, right? Um, there was no reason for you to invest that time into reading if you're not gonna be able to remember what you read later. So that's why this recite step is so important. Finally, last step, review. So this would just be, um, reviewing, uh, read over all of the relevant parts of your reading, um, kind of go through the notes you made, the questions you had, the questions that came up, um, the reciting portion that you did, just kind of remind yourself about all of these steps and this whole process. And this review step can happen a little bit later from the others if you want. Um, for instance, I know a lot of people kind of do steps one through four, then they go to lecture and then they review based on some of the lecture material that they got as well. So again, this is all meant to be tailored to how you work, but this is a good framework from which you can kind of test things out and see um, what might be most helpful for you. But again, the key takeaways here are to do the survey and questioning before you start, um, to read in a very active way where you're asking questions, and to make sure that you recite what you read um, in some form or another, to make sure that you're actually um, 
ingesting this information and able to synthesize it and remember it later. So this diagram kind of goes into a little bit more um, specifics about this process, a little bit more about the how-tos, um, if you're curious about that. I won't go over this in too much detail, just in the interest of time. But for instance, if you're wondering, you know, like, what do I actually do when I'm surveying? Um, it kind of gives you instructions here, like looking over the headings, thinking about background knowledge, reading a summary or an abstract if that's there. So this is something you can kind of look over when you're practicing um, this SQ3R strategy. So this is an example I kind of wanted to show you guys. Um, we're running a little low on time, so I won't spend too long on this. This is something uh, you can look over on your own as well afterward. So this would be an example of a reading, um, just an excerpt from a textbook about the Industrial Revolution. So if you kind of walk through all the steps here, um, you survey, you see that there's a heading uh, with a specific name of something, which kind of cues you to expect like, okay, this is probably going to be about the Industrial Revolution. Um, questions you might ask yourself, like, do I know what that is? If I don't, uh, what do I know about it? What don't I know about it? Um, you kind of go through, do the reading, kind of note your questions as you go along, note things you don't understand. Um, and then recite afterwards, kind of say aloud to yourself or say aloud to a study partner or even just write down for yourself a short summary of what it is that you read afterwards. And then you have all of these notes to review later. So this is an example. Um, I think this example came from the Learning Center at Oregon State University. So this was kind of the um, tutor's notes from this um, reading, where she kind of noted down the main idea. Okay, there were countless innovations. Uh, she noted down some of the examples that the paragraph was talking about. And she noted down some questions that she had. For instance, um, what's a turbine? Something she could look up later, ask her professor. Um, some questions about, you know, when exactly the tractor came to be. Was that before or after or during uh, the Industrial Revolution? So you're not, you know, when you're reading, you're not expected to understand everything. And in fact, these questions are part of like the key part of studying really is as you're reading and noting down this information, you also note down things that you don't know or things that you need to look up or um, ask your professor later. So this is an example of, you know, how you might go about reading. Of course, everyone is different and doesn't it in, does it in a different way, but um, this is just kind of a framework for how you can proceed with this. And above all, maximize um, the effort you're putting into reading and make sure that you're actually gaining information from the process rather than sort of mindlessly reading this paragraph and forgetting it 10 minutes later. So moving into effective note-taking strategies. So this is one example. I'm going to move my, I don't know if you guys can see my own face, but I'm going to slide myself over to stop blocking this. Um, so this is one example of a note-taking method, which is called the Cornell method. And maybe some of you have heard of this already or do this already. And the Cornell method really says that you should divide up your note your notes pages into three sections. One is the actual notes that you take, you know, during the lecture, during class, um, where you're using shorthand, you're writing kind of in live time, um, you're noting down all the important points, and it obviously happens during class. And then there's a cue column on the left. Here is something you sort of do um, after class when you're reviewing your notes. And this is where you pull out the main points from all of your notes. And you note those main points down, you note kind of outstanding questions that you have, um, any diagrams that are relevant, any sort of study prompts. If your professor highlights something that's important for you to know, you would kind of note that down in the cue column. And so this column kind of really helps you orient yourself again. Um, it helps you determine what was important from the notes that you took and what you should be understanding, as well as sometimes what you don't understand yet um, and what you might need to study some more. So finally, the summary column. Um, so this is kind of, as you can imagine, a summary of your notes from this topic. Um, it's kind of an area that you can reference when you're trying to remember, okay, what is the overall message? Um, 
what should I take away from this information? And this also occurs um, after class during your review stages. So you can see that there's kind of a couple steps going into this whole thing. Um, there's the effective reading prior to class, there's the notes that you take during class, um, and then there's sort of these after class steps of uh, putting together this cue column, putting together your summary and kind of reviewing everything that was discussed. Um, this is just one way to do it. Different people have different opinions about what's best in terms of note taking and studying. Um, some people find this super helpful, some people don't. So I have a video for you guys as well. Um, hopefully it'll work, but this one kind of argues against the Cornell method a little bit and says that really the Cornell method is not the best way to do it. There are other ways that might be more effective. And so what I wanna to convey to all of you is that sometimes it's trial and error. It's worth trying out these different strategies and finding what works for you. Everyone's brain works a little bit differently. Everyone has different needs. Everyone learns in a different way as some of our previous lectures have shown. Um, so you know, don't take everything I'm saying as like the rules for how to study, but rather take these as different strategies that you can try out for yourself and figure out what works. Um, and each of these kind of have their own body of evidence supporting them. Um, but again, try it out for yourself. So I'm going to play this video. Since the very beginning, I've spoken at great length about how space repetition with active recall is a foundational component to achieving stellar results in school. We've even gone over how to create good Anki flashcards, which is rarely done properly even by popular study experts. But even more foundational is how to take good notes. I'll show you how to do just that. Dr. Jabal, MedSchoolInsiders.com. Taking good notes, whether from class or from your textbook, is nuanced and messy. It's part of the reason I've pushed off talking about note taking for so long. Unlike many other components to studying, like memorization techniques, note taking doesn't naturally fall into a straightforward and streamlined process. To consistently take useful notes, you'll need to be adaptable with your approach, adjusting based on several variables such as the content you're learning, the lecturer who's teaching you, and a few other factors. Let's get started. First, what is the purpose of taking notes? This may seem obvious, but it's at this foundational question that many students get tripped up. You should not be taking notes to copy verbatim from the professor or textbook. This is the most common offense. Rather, notes are a tool used to facilitate comprehension, memorization, and more effective future studying. You can think of note taking as two discrete steps, process function and product function. The process function refers to the fact that the act of taking notes while listening to lecture improves your comprehension and retention, regardless of whether you review those notes. The product function refers to the ability to review the notes in the future and commit facts to memory through rehearsal, organization, or elaboration. With that in mind, how should we decide what type of device to use when taking notes? Write on a notepad and you lose much of the convenience of storing files digitally or having them searchable or being able to quickly insert images. Type on a computer and you cannot easily draw or you may be prone to distractions like social media or instant messaging. Additionally, Mueller and Oppenheimer in 2014 demonstrated that typing notes on a laptop is more likely to result in transcribing lectures verbatim rather than deeper information processing and reframing into one's own words. In short, less of it actually sticks. Based on the Mueller and Oppenheimer paper, you may jump to the conclusion that taking notes by hand is superior than on the computer. As always, the actual science is far more nuanced than lazy thinking and black and white summaries would have you believe. Mueller and Oppenheimer found an advantage to handwritten notes with regards to conceptual testing, but no difference with regards to factual testing. Additionally, this only tested the process function of note taking, meaning taking the notes, but not the product function, meaning reviewing the notes. When they did allow laptop and written note takers to review their notes, the handwritten notes performed better in both factual and conceptual testing. Settled? Not yet. Dung and colleagues in 2012 found opposing results, demonstrating that when participants could study their notes, those who used a computer to transcribe the lectures performed the best on delayed recall tests. Similarly, Fiorella and Mayer in 2017 showed that when allowed to study one's notes, those who used a laptop performed better on factual information recall than those who took notes by hand, postulating that those taking longhand notes experience greater extraneous cognitive processing, which is ultimately a distraction, a problem not faced by laptop note takers. 
Perhaps these seemingly conflicting findings are best addressed by Luo et al. in 2018, who addressed the main shortcomings of the three previous studies. This table beautifully summarizes the key findings from each study. Seems confusing? It should, since there are several conflicting findings on the surface level. With all this conflicting data, what should we believe? Again, nuance is key and the devil is in the details. Here are the best practices I recommend based on the data. First, eliminate distractions. Completely disable all notifications and enter airplane mode if necessary to eliminate distractions from a laptop or tablet while taking notes in class. Failing to do so drastically reduces any benefits offered by using an electronic device. Number two, avoid transcribing. I type at 145 words per minute, and if you're also a fast typist, you may find it easy to transcribe what the lecturer is saying verbatim. This is a highly passive form of note taking, and as we've discussed many times on this channel, active learning is king. While in lecture, your priority should be to understand the information. To facilitate this process and avoid regurgitating, put it into your own words. The data on the utility of transcribing is conflicting, but that's due to study limitations and overall poor note-taking strategies within the studies. Number three, take advantage of images and figures. Regardless of the medium you use when taking notes, prioritize incorporating relevant images and figures into your notes. With handwritten notes, you can draw them in yourself. With a laptop or tablet, you can take a photo or screenshot and insert them directly into your notes. Which brings us to our last point. Traditionally, we look to either typing on a laptop or writing in a notebook, but each system has significant downsides. As we now enter a new decade in 2020, tablet devices are more affordable and accessible than ever, and they allow for the best of both worlds. The convenience of typing and digital notes with the ability to draw and annotate. I went with an iPad Pro with Apple Pencil, but even a regular $300 iPad will get the job done. Windows users should look to the Microsoft Surface. If you have a different suggestion, share it with the rest of us in the comments below. In terms of app, I highly recommend Notability or OneNote, as both allow for a flexible system of drawing, typing, and importing images or PDFs that you can annotate. I used to use Evernote and Apple Notes, but their drawing functionality is highly restrictive. And while I do love Notion, the lack of drawing or annotating holds it back in the purposes of in-class note-taking. Now that we have the fundamentals in place, how do we approach note-taking most effectively? The first step is to take good notes. Cornell notes follow an intelligent structure that facilitate active learning and recall. On the left side, you write down keywords or questions that you use to quiz yourself later. On the right hand side, you take your notes in traditional nested outline format. At the bottom, you write a summary of the information on the page. While well-intentioned, I do not recommend you use this format as there are much better ways to incorporate active learning and recall into your daily studying, which we'll get to shortly. The outline method is my favorite, and it's one of the most popular methods used by college and medical students. It's quite simple. You start with a main topic or idea, and if there is a subtopic related to that idea, you nest it with an indent. If you have another supporting fact of that subtopic, you nest that point further. This allows for a clean, organized, and straightforward way to organize the information from class. You should use this as your default go-to in most situations. If this seems straightforward and simple, it should. That's because during this stage, you're simply seeking to understand and organize the information in a way that makes sense to you. It's in the next step where additional effort and adaptability comes in. Once we've taken the notes, the key to learning the information and crushing your exams isn't to simply review the notes again and again. That's the silly brute force method I used in college, and it's the method most students use to much frustration. Rather, you need to practice forms of active learning. In determining the method to use, consider what makes the coursework challenging. Most classes are either fact-heavy or concept-heavy. In fact-heavy courses, there is simply an immense amount of information you need to memorize, but the facts aren't all that difficult to make sense of. Think of history or psychology. Concept-heavy, on the other hand, means the difficulty lies in understanding and applying the concepts. Think mathematics, neuroscience, or cardiology. It's not a black and white either or, as just about all subjects have a mix of facts you need to memorize and difficult concepts to understand, but some will be more dominant in facts and some will be more dominant in concepts. Understanding how fact or concept dominant a subject is will guide you in how to study most effectively. Summary sheets, also known as condensed notes, are notes you take of your notes. I know, pretty meta. Essentially, you're trimming the fat, condensing, and synthesizing your notes into something more manageable. Don't simply write smaller. Rather, you should be making connections you didn't realize during lecture and synthesizing the information in new ways, such as in tables or other visuals. 
Summary sheets get a bad rap amongst the evidence-based learning community because some studies have shown they aren't all that effective. I'd argue they are indeed quite helpful. Again, nuance is key. When certain study strategies are employed in a research setting, the nuance is understandably lost. For summary sheets to be worthwhile, two conditions must be met. First, the subject should be concept heavy, and second, don't simply copy your notes, but make it an active learning process by actively seeking to understand, make connections, and simplify. This shouldn't be easy or comfortable, but that's to be expected of any effective active learning method. In my pulmonology block during the first year of medical school, I scored in the top three of my entire first year class. I first took simple outline method notes as I attended lecture. Here's a sample PowerPoint slide with my notes below. Later on, I went home and condensed the notes into a single piece of paper front and back that looked something like this. I took a photo and saved it to Evernote for me to reference later when I needed to review. Next up, synthesis questions, which are appropriate amongst a broader range of subjects. I'm grateful that my medical school provided us with learning objective questions, which was my first introduction to the practice of synthesis questions. But you don't need someone else to make them for you. You can make them yourself. Let's take cardiology block during my first year of medical school, one of the most conceptually challenging blocks, but also one of the blocks where I set the curve and ranked number one in my medical school. Again, I started off with outline method notes, but after lecture, I worked on synthesis questions. Again, this is best served when it becomes an active process, such as when you're making a table of two similar but distinct entities. Simply copying down information does not help you here. For example, after learning about skeletal and cardiac muscle, I made a table comparing the two. Here's another table comparing systemic and pulmonary blood circulations. The process of making the table was an active process that reinforced the material and my understanding of it, plus I had the added benefit of a high yield table to review at a future date. Third, we all right, so I'm going to stop here in the interest of time. Um, so I know this video is obviously very medical school focused and focusing on this guy's particular experience, but I think it's helpful because he kind of presents a range of different methods and highlights, you know, um, process versus product function and highlights the importance of also assessing what it is that you're learning. So what class are you actually in? Is this the type of class where you're expected to memorize a lot of stuff and keep it in your memory? Or is this a class where you're really expected to hone in on the concepts and make these connections and have more of a critical thinking approach? So that's kind of a first step in, in adopting any sort of learning strategy is assess what it is that you're learning. Um, both types of learning are present in all study programs. So that's something I would recommend for all of you as well, is taking that time to figure out what it is that you're learning and make sure that your study strategies and um, um, like methods are in line with what it is that you actually need to do, um, which might vary from class to class. So again, um, you all, I think I sent Marky a PDF of these slides so you can review this video again if you're interested, but it's all about sort of reviewing the options of different strategies, um, reviewing what it is that you actually need to learn and when, and then testing out different things to see how it is that you work. But main takeaways again are making sure that you're using your pre, during, and post class time effectively. Um, and that also includes making sure you're in an environment where that's possible. And then also kind of trying out different things and making sure that your learning process is active because above all, active learning is really what makes sure that you're ingesting that information and able to retain it long-term. Um, so I'm gonna wrap up now. Let me stop sharing my screen. All right, so thank you all so much for listening to this recording. Um, I'll give you all, you know, time to discuss with each other and of course discuss in your small groups and feel free to reach out to me if you have any further questions. And um, Natalie will be here next week to speak to you. Take care, everyone.